Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Very excited to have you. Today's program is part of the Presidential Primary Sources Project, and our program today is Becoming Eleanor Roosevelt, and it's being presented by Jeff Urban from the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library. The Presidential Primary Sources Project is a collaboration between Internet2, the National Archives, and the National Park Service. It's a series we do every year um, from January to the beginning of April, every Tuesday and Thursday. This is just a quick reminder by participating today, you are agreeing to be recorded, streamed, and broadcast. So um, we do keep all of our programs on our YouTube channel for teachers and students to access later. All right, if you want to participate in video and you're not on video, you can drop me a message in the chat and I will help promote you so we can see your video. Um, if you just want to use your voice, you can use the little raise hand icon and we can help you unmute. And then, of course, there's the chat box. So if you haven't already um, found the chat box, it looks kind of like a little caption bubble. Go ahead and click on that. We will use that a bunch throughout the presentation. And then please do participate. It's so much more fun if we can hear your thoughts and your questions. Um, that said, just be really respectful of our interactive tools so that we're staying focused on our presentation today and asking and responding to specifically what our presenter is speaking about. All right, and I just wanna thank you again for coming. We're excited to have you. This is our website. If you wanna check out our last few programs this year um, or access our recordings. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to the marvelous Jeffrey Urban. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. I'm glad to be here and happy to uh, be with you. I just lost my image. So am I still being seen? Yes, there I am. Okay. Yeah, um, I can still see you. Great. Sorry about that. Thanks. I'm happy to be with everybody. Um, happy spring, although here in New York, it feels like winter. It was 22 degrees outside. Um, I actually had icicles on my, I have chickens in my backyard and they had icicles on them. Um, so they're like chicken sickles. Um, but anyway, I'm glad to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, I guess it's really more of a person than a topic uh, if you get right down to the, to the heart of it. But Eleanor Roosevelt is an incredible human being and an incredible person. And um, notice I said person and not woman, right? Um, because sometimes, you know, people act like, oh, well, she was a woman. So, you know, she's got a different set of standards. No, she was just an incredible human being. And um, <clears throat> the way she became an incredible human being was through a lot of trial and error and a lot of... Um, um, unhappiness and turmoil, unfortunately, um, in her life. So um, what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about Eleanor Roosevelt and how she became the famous Eleanor Roosevelt that we all um, know and uh, love and appreciate um, and admire. Um, she's admired not just in this country, but actually around the world. If you go anywhere in the world and you say, you know, the words Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, people will know who you are talking about because as Harry Truman called her, she was first lady, not just of the United States, but first lady of the world. And the reason for that was because um, she took the causes of so many people um, around um, the country and around the world, and she tried to bring light to shine upon them. She tried to bring focus on those things so that um, people who did not have a voice would have a voice. And people who did not have access to power would have some access um, to uh, to power. So to do this, to understand who she is, we're going to first take a look at her life. And a lot of times people will ask me, hey, if you had to pick one word to describe Eleanor Roosevelt, what would it be? And, you know, the words like amazing, awesome, um, really cool, which is actually two words, but hey, um, right? Uh, th these are all words I would use to describe Eleanor Roosevelt, but you can't really use just one word. So I'm going to split it out and use two words. And the two words I'm going to use are the words compassion and the word betrayal, okay? Now, compassion means feeling for somebody, right? Having some, some sense of feeling of what they're going through, some sense of understanding, some, some sense of camaraderie with them, you know, showing them empathy. Betrayal means thinking one thing is going to happen and feeling like you can trust somebody, and then they kind of let you down. Right? Sometimes it's dramatically, sometimes it's less dramatically, sometimes it's intentionally, sometimes it's not intentional, but nonetheless, you are betrayed. And these are the two words, I think, that really um, speak to who Eleanor Roosevelt was 
and how Eleanor Roosevelt uh, became Eleanor Roosevelt. And it starts when she is born. She's born in New York City on October 11th in 1884, right? It's a long time ago. And she is born into the Roosevelt clan. Now, um, the Roosevelts had two sort of branches of their family. One was the Teddy Roosevelt, right? President Teddy Roosevelt. And he sort of centered his family around the Long Island, New York area, the Oyster Bay Roosevelts. And they actually pronounced their name Roosevelt that branch, the Oyster Bay folks. The folks that came up the Hudson River, those are the ones that I work for. Um, those were the Roosevelts. And so um, they're two separate branches of the family, but they're all connected and, and, and such. But the Roosevelts of New York City were very well connected and um, had a lot of um, you know interests and a lot of activities going on in New York. And in fact, um, Eleanor's mother was a very, you know, fancy sort of socialite, you know, well-connected, kind of like the in crowd, one of the cool kids, you know, um, in New York. And when Eleanor was born, uh, her mother was really disappointed with the way she looked. And as Eleanor began to grow up, her mother was very disappointed in the way Eleanor uh, continued to look and the way that Eleanor carried herself. And so much so, because, you know, her mother was this big, fancy, beautiful, well-connected, cool kid. And Eleanor Roosevelt was kind of an ugly duckling. And um, so much so that her mother took to calling her Granny as a nickname. Right, right? Granny, imagine that, right? Not sweetheart, muffin, pumpkin, princess, but Granny. Now, you don't have to be a psychologist to understand that if somebody's calling you granny, right, um, that that's going to have an impact on your self-esteem, right? Name calling matters, right? Words matter. And so Eleanor began to think of herself in this, in this way. Now, I want to share a picture of you uh, with you of Eleanor Roosevelt. This is her when she's about four years old. And I don't think she's so, you know, ugly ducklingy. Right. I mean, I have to admit, maybe the bangs are a little bit tight here, right, on the old uh, haircut there. Right. But the rest of her is kind of cute. Right. What do you want from a four year old? But her mother never thought that she really um, lived up to her standard uh, of beauty. And she referred to her as granny because she thought she looked like a little old lady and that she thought that she carried herself like a little old lady. Her father was a neglected alcoholic. What I mean by that is he never abused her or was mean to her, but when he got drinking, he tended to forget about her. And, um, you know, once he got drinking, that was like the focus of the rest of his day. So one day, just to give you an example of what I mean by a neglective alcoholic, um, he had promised Eleanor a big day in the city. Okay, Eleanor, today we're going to go into New York. And if you want to ride on the carousel in Central Park, we'll do that. If you want to, um, Go up to the top of, you know, the tallest building in the city. We'll do that. If you want to see a show, we'll do that. Lunch out, we'll do it. Whatever you want. It's daddy-daughter day in the city. So they get on a train. They get into New York. And um, what happens is uh, her father says, oh, I forgot. I've got to go to a meeting real quick. And then we'll get right on our day. Well, he goes into a hotel that has a bar. And he goes to in there and he starts drinking. And he totally forgets Eleanor is out front. And she's sitting on the stoop out in front of the building. Over an hour and a half goes by. She tugs on the doorman's jacket, and says, when am my dad going to be out of this meeting? We have a big day planned here in New York. And the doorman goes in and finds out what happened. He comes back out and he says, little girl, your, your father's going home. Um, you know, he got drunk and they sent him out the back, uh, the back way uh, home in a cab so that, you know, he wouldn't be, you know, seen stumbling out of the, the building. This is what I'm talking about when I mean, um, a neglective alcoholic. Um, by the time she's 10 years old, both of her parents are dead. Her mother um, dies of diphtheria and her father dies of complications from alcohol. And so Eleanor is then passed around from family member to family member to family member. So she goes and she lives with an aunt for a little while. And then after a couple of months, well, Eleanor, it's time for you to move on. And then she goes and she lives with a cousin for a little while. Well, little Eleanor, it's time for you to move on, you know, after a couple of weeks, after a couple of months. And so this word betrayal is starting to play out already, right? She's betrayed by her mother who will not instill in her a sense of confidence or, you know, 
good self-esteem because she feels like she's an ugly duckling. She's betrayed by her father who makes all kinds of promises when he's sober and then breaks them all when he's drunk. She's betrayed by the extended members of her family who say, yeah, you're welcome for a limited time only. And then they come in, you know, she comes in and she stays with them. She passes around from family member to family member. And she finally ends up with um, her grandma Hall, her mother's mother. And she ends up way up here in Dutchess County um, in a place called Tivoli. And um, she lives there with her grandma Hall. Now her grandma Hall was a very strict disciplinarian and a very straight laced, stern kind of a woman. And the household was not a lot of fun to be in. Um, you know, she didn't allow singing except on Sunday, right? Cause you know, music was for God, you know, you know so you weren't supposed to be using it during the week and such. And if Eleanor made even the slightest mistakes around the house, her grandmother would get very angry with her and would sometimes give her the cold shoulder for three or four days at a time. So if, she asked Eleanor, Eleanor, can you set the dining room table for lunch? And Eleanor put the forks on the wrong side of the table, you know, on the wrong side of the plate. Her grandmother, oh, well, we've talked about this a hundred times. You know, can't you do anything right? And then she wouldn't talk to her again for three or four days, right? That's really, you know, that's really not a lot of fun. But it was even worse than that. Also living in the house were two of Eleanor's uncles, and they also were alcoholics. And what they used to do is in the afternoon, they would get drunk. They would go up into the attic, they'd open the attic windows, and then they would shoot rifles at Eleanor. Now, not directly at her, but if she was at the potting shed, potting plants, and she would pot one and set it down and go to get the next one, they would shoot the one that she just potted just to scare her, just to see her jump. If she had been out riding her pony and was bringing her pony back down for the cool down, you know, where you brush the pony down and you give them a little snack, they might shoot into the bale of hay to see the pony jump and to see Eleanor jump uh, as well. And so this was not a good situation, right? Imagine that's the environment you're being brought up in. Um, not a good place. So Grandma Hall said, this is not good. Sooner or later, something's going to happen here, and we got to get this girl out of here. So she packs her up at 15, and she takes her over, sends her over to Allenwood School, which is a private school over in England. And it's there that Eleanor Roosevelt meets this person right here. This woman's name is Madam Silvestri. And she is the headmaster or the headmistress of the Allenwood School. She's the big cheese. And she takes an interest in Eleanor Roosevelt. And she is the first person to see in Eleanor Roosevelt um, what the, um, the, uh, um, the rest of the, um, the folks in the world are going to see in Eleanor later on. She says to Eleanor, listen, you're a smart girl. You know, you've got ideas. You've got uh, uh, ways of thinking about things. Talk to the other girls, challenge them, you know, uh, talk to them about uh, social issues, about uh, current events, about things that you feel passionate about. Argue with them. If they tell you something and you don't agree with it, argue with them and make them prove their point. You prove your point. Write down what you're thinking, right? You've got important ideas. Write them down and travel, right? You're over here in England. You're not far from the rest of Europe. If you get an opportunity, you know, go out and see what's going on out there in the rest of the continent. And that's exactly what Eleanor did. And she began to flower. So you can kind of think of Madame Suvestri here as kind of like a coach. Right? Have you ever had a cool coach you know, that kind of you know, um, says, hey, man, you've got some real talent there. You know, you got to keep working on that and encourages you. That's what Madame Suvestri did. So much so that, in fact, she kept this picture of Madame Suvestri on her desk for the rest of her life. Right. And she, she got this picture when she was um, when she left Allenwood School. So at the age of 18, she graduates from Allenwood School and she comes back to New York. And she says that her three years at Allenwood School were the most um, happiest years of, uh, of her life because um, it was there that she really began to come into her own and feel comfortable talking about what it was that she wanted to talk about. She comes back to New York. And she takes a job working in a tenement house, which is a house where poor people live um, in New York back in the day. And she goes to work there teaching the children how to um, 
how to read, how to take care of themselves, you know, how to keep clean, you know, do that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, basically just how to live a little bit better life. And while she's in New York, she bumps into an old cousin of hers, a guy by the name of Franklin Roosevelt. Remember I said they've got two branches of the family? Well, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, she was a Roosevelt, he was a Roosevelt. They were actually related to each other. They were what's called fifth cousins once removed. So what that means is if you take Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and you go back five generations, almost 200 years, they share a common relative. And um, they had kind of known each other growing up because of the family reunions and things, but they had never really taken much of an interest in each other until uh, when Eleanor was 19 and Franklin was 21, they rediscover each other and they fell in love. And here is a picture of what Eleanor looked like uh, at that time. Now, I think she's really you know, very cute. I love this picture of her because this is, you know, this is her really, you know, you can see uh, some confidence in her face. You can see that, you know, she's got these, these sort of soulful eyes, you know, and this little, just a hint of a smile. And um, her hair was done nice and Franklin cannot help but fall in love with her. And the more he gets to know her, the more he falls in love with her, um, you know, because she is beginning to come out of her shell, right? And she's been some places in Europe. She's done some reading. She's argued with people. So she's able to kind of hold her own um, with, uh, with Franklin. So Franklin decides he's in love with her. She decides that uh, she's in love with him. And they say, all right, woohoo, let's get married. And he tells his mom, hey, mom, I'm going to marry Eleanor Roosevelt. And his mother says, what? Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just keep this quiet for a while, huh? I mean, Eleanor's a great gal. Don't get me wrong, right? And she had known Eleanor all throughout her life. But she said, let's do this. Let's just keep it quiet for a year okay we'll, we'll keep it secret the engagement and then after that you can you know you can you know go ahead and get married and such now sarah had an alternative motive she did not want any competition for franklin's attention and that's what eleanor was sarah uh, only had one child franklin her husband had died by this point and she had nobody else you know in the world that she could dote over and be all you know snuggly with and such and so eleanor represented a threat to her attention, um, uh, you know, uh, for Franklin's attention, taking that attention away from her. Not only does she say, let's wait a year, but she takes Franklin on a six week tour all throughout the Caribbean, hoping that six weeks apart will make him forget about Eleanor. Okay, but it wasn't a, a matter of absence. It was a matter of absence makes the heart grow fonder, not out of sight, out of mind. So they come back. And they keep it quiet uh, for a year. Now, here's, again, a sense of betrayal, right? Here's this young woman who's had kind of a rough life growing up, right, with her mother calling her granny, her father being an alcoholic and a neglected alcoholic, uh, the Roosevelt family kind of welcoming her in, but not really taking her in, you know, making her one of their own. Good old stern Grandma Hall. Um, you know, not until she meets Madame Silvestri does somebody really take an interest in her. Now she meets this love of her life, Franklin Roosevelt, and she wants to, you know, scream from the rooftops, "Hey, I'm in love!" You know, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna marry Franklin Roosevelt. And her mother-in-law says, "No, no, no, keep it quiet for a year. I don't really want you guys getting married. Keep it quiet for a year." And so this is another form of um, of betrayal when it comes to that. So they do keep it quiet for a year. And at the end of the year, uh, they decide they're going to make the announcement. So they make the announcement in December um, of 1904. And then a year later, they get married in New York City on March 17th, uh, 1905. So they, they would have been married 117 years uh, this, this month. And here is a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt in her wedding gown with her uh, flowers and such. This was actually taken in January of 1905, um, a couple of months before the wedding. She was trying on the dress and making sure it all looked good and everything. There are no real pictures of the wedding. They didn't have a photographer there. And if they had had a photographer there, there would have been one problem. Um, there would still be many pictures of Franklin and Eleanor because Eleanor asked um, her uncle Teddy to walk her down the aisle. Um, you know, there's like a tradition that when a, when a young woman gets married, her dad kind of walks her down the aisle and then hands her over, you know, to the, to the husband. You know, it's a little um, sexist and a little outdated, but, you know, nonetheless, um, 
you have that. And um, so she needed somebody to walk her down the aisle. And so she picked Uncle Teddy, her favorite uncle. Well, Uncle Teddy said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. But you want to know what? Here's what's going to have to happen. Um, I'm going to be in New York on March 17th, 1905. That's the day you should get married. It's the only day I've got available. I'm going to be in New York anyway for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. I'll swing over, walk you down the aisle, swing back to the parade. Nobody will know. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, oh, that'll be great. But she later said it was one of the biggest mistakes she ever made. Because on her wedding day, when she was supposed to be the center of attention, everybody was paying attention not to her, but to Uncle Teddy, because he was the president, right? He was a big, larger-than-life kind of a character. And everybody was paying attention to him at their wedding and not her. But Mrs. Roosevelt learns a very valuable lesson from this, and I want to pick that up again in a couple of minutes. So in a way, she's betrayed by her uncle who comes in and it's supposed to be, you know, it'd be like you guys having a birthday party and then, you know, you, you have a birthday party, all your friends are over and then your kid brother walks in with a new turtle and everybody's like, oh, wow, cool. And they all go look at the turtle and you're like, hey, it's my birthday over here. Hello. Right. But that's kind of the way it was with Eleanor's, um, Eleanor's wedding. So they go uh, to Europe for three months on a honeymoon. Must be nice. Right. And they travel all around Europe and they visit all over and then they come back, and Eleanor's um, mother-in-law, Franklin's mother, has bought them a townhouse in New York City. And the way it works is uh, you've got a door that goes in. It's like a big, tall building, six stories tall. You go in one door, and then inside there's two other doors. One was for the apartment for Eleanor and Franklin. The other was an apartment for Sarah. And on each of the floors, there were doors with the locks on Sarah's side so that she could pop in on the newlyweds anytime. Hi, kids, it's me. Um, and they couldn't pop in on her. So she begins this very dominating role in their marriage. You know, Eleanor really wanted to come back from Europe and find a house with Franklin. Remember, she had never had her own home. Right? She's bounced around from family member to family member. This was important for her. And that opportunity was taken away from her inadvertently, but nonetheless, by her mother-in-law. I love this picture of um, Eleanor and Sarah because I think it tells a lot about the relationship. Look what the body language we have here. We've got Sarah, right? That's Franklin's mother. And she's standing all straight back. She's looking at Eleanor right here in the face. She's got a book. This is, I like to think of this as the Roosevelt family rule book. And, you know, very stern. There you are, right? Here's poor Eleanor. She's looking down, right? So she's deferring down. Her eyes are pointed down. She's clasping her hands like she's all nervous. And it's kind of like, okay, sissy, if you want to marry my kid, you know, here's how it's going to be. You're going to have to do this and that. And here's the family rule book and da da da. And Eleanor's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Oh, I'll try. You know, and this, I think, really determines a lot of what their relationship um, is, uh, is all about. So what ends up happening is um, they get married, and Sarah gives them the townhouse. Franklin becomes assistant secretary of the Navy um, after serving first in the New York State Senate. And then um, Woodrow Wilson appoints him to be assistant secretary of the Navy. And they move down to Washington, D.C. And when they get down to Washington, D.C., uh, Franklin's job requires him to do two important components. Number one, he's got to travel all around the world and visit um, the American naval bases, right? He's the assistant secretary of the Navy. He has to make sure all the sailors are doing what they're supposed to do and the ships are in good shape and the ports are in good shape. So she, he's, he's, away from Sarah, uh, he's away from Eleanor a lot. Sarah comes down to Washington to help out with the kids and to be with Eleanor, right? So again, here we go, right? Um, Sarah again. Now, meanwhile, the other part of Franklin's job, when he's not out traveling around the world or around the country visiting American naval bases, he's got to stay in Washington, and he has to go to all the big fancy parties. Uh, and because it's a big fancy party, you've got big fancy people. And the big fancy people are the ones that are making everything happen in Washington. Senators, congressmen, campaign donors, lobbyists, all these fancy folks. And Eleanor goes, but she doesn't like it. And she's, you know, she's still kind of shy. She's still kind of timid. So she eventually says to Franklin, listen, you know, what? I can't do this anymore. I, don't, I, I can't go. I can't go. You got to go with somebody else. And Franklin says, what? Who am I, gonna, who, who am I supposed to go with? So Eleanor says, well, um, uh, how about my social secretary, Lucy Mercer? 
And this was Eleanor Roosevelt's social secretary, Lucy Mercer. Now, Lucy Mercer was a good looking lady. She was smart. She could tell good jokes. She laughed at jokes when she was told jokes and she didn't mind a cocktail or two. Eleanor did not like to go to these cocktail parties because of the alcoholism in her family. So what happens is Franklin and Lucy Mercer start getting friendly. They start getting cozy. One thing leads to the other. And before you know it, he's cheating on Eleanor. So here she, I know, right? Here she is once again. Now she's betrayed by her own social secretary. Well, how does she find out about this? We don't know when exactly the affair started, but we do know when it ended. It ended at the end of the First World War. Franklin Roosevelt came back from overseas. He had a touch of pneumonia, which he was afraid was going to turn into the big pandemic that they had back in 1918. So he said, all right, I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to lay down. I don't feel so good. And Eleanor begins to unpack his uh, suitcases. And in there, she finds a satchel of love letters from Lucy Mercer, dun, 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 the other woman. And she says to Franklin, you know what? I didn't read everything, but what I read tells me that you love this woman. And if you love this woman, you need to be with her, not with me. So now here she is again, betrayed by her husband who cheats on her and by her own social secretary, right? Here's two people she trusted. And guess what? Here you go. Well, um, they end up uh, working out a deal, and Franklin says, "You know, we'll, we'll stay married. We'll stay married, please." You know, and the reason they said that, she said that, uh, well, he said that, excuse me, was because um, Sarah, his mother, said, "No, no, no, no. There'll be no divorce here, pal. You fell in love with her. You married her. You cheated on her. You patch it up. And if you can't patch it up, I'm cutting you off from the Roosevelt family fortune. So you'll be on your own, pal. You know, if this doesn't work." So they worked it out because of that. But it gave Eleanor some leverage in the marriage because now, you know, it was harder for Franklin to boss her around because after what he had done, right, anything she did was probably not going to be as bad. And so um, it gave her a little bit of, of movement and a little bit of leverage. You know, she wanted to do something. He said, I don't think that's a good idea. Well, you know, you wouldn't even have a political career if it wasn't for me, pal. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And Eleanor began to sort of exert herself that way. Well, I don't want to bore you with the history part, but he becomes president, Great Depression, World War II, right? All that sort of stuff. But there was an interesting thing that happened, um, and that's a whole other story for a whole other day. If you're interested in that, um, we can come back and talk about that some other time. So here's what happens with this. One day um, in Washington, there was a woman by the name of Marian Anderson who was supposed to give a concert at Constitution Hall, which was a, a, you know, a concert hall in Washington, D.C., well, they wouldn't let Marian Anderson sing there because she was an African-American, and uh, there was prejudice back then even, right? And so it was a segregated city where you couldn't have a Black performer performing for this white audience. And when Eleanor Roosevelt found out about this, she said, hey, that's not fair. The voice doesn't have a color. It has a tone. It has a tenor. You know, it has emotion, but no color. If you don't let her sing there, I am going to resign my membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR. Those were the ones that were sponsoring the concert. So they said, well, she can't sing. And Eleanor said, okay, then I quit. And she resigned her membership in protest, okay? Standing up for her buddy, for her friend. Six weeks later, on Easter Sunday, 1939, a big concert was held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And um, 75,000 people attended that. It was an outdoor concert. 75,000 people show up. One really important person was invited, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she didn't go. And she didn't go. And here's a picture of that concert, just a still shot, right? There's Marian Anderson. Look at all the microphones, right? Because you got a microphone out to 75,000 people. There's good old Abraham Lincoln back there in the background. Eleanor Roosevelt did not go to this concert, despite the fact she was Marian Anderson's friend, and despite the fact that she quit her membership in the DAR because they wouldn't let Marian Anderson uh, sing there. And the reason she wouldn't do that is because she remembered back to March 17, 1905, when she invited a big shot, famous guy, her uncle, Teddy, the president, to her wedding, and nobody paid attention to her. Eleanor Roosevelt knew that if she went as Eleanor Roosevelt, 
everybody would be talking about Eleanor Roosevelt attends concert for some African American woman. Right? She wanted Marian Anderson to have her moment in the sun. And boys and girls, I love that story about Eleanor Roosevelt because that tells you the kind of person that she was. She was always looking to apply lessons that she learned in her life to other places. Now, keep in mind, she kept this lesson in her heart and in her mind from March 17, 1905, all the way on up to Easter Sunday, 19. 39, right? That's a pretty long time to carry a lesson and look for a way to, uh, to use it. But that's the kind of person Eleanor Roosevelt was. So they continue on in the White House, la di da President Roosevelt, World War II. And then on April 12th, 1945, Franklin Roosevelt is very ill. Um, he's, he's got a high blood pressure and he's, he's got a heart problem and he's fighting the war or the world war. And he's just back from Yalta, which was a big wartime conference. And he says, oh, you know, I'm going to go to my vacation place down in Warm Springs, Georgia, which was a, a nice, uh, actually he built it into a hospital to help people with polio because he'd had polio. And he used to go down there and it was like a vacation spot. He lay in the warm sun, get the warm sun on his legs. There were um, pools of, of uh, mineral water, which made him more buoyant. So he was you know, able to sort of stay up in the water and such. And he goes down there. And um, what happens is one day on April 12th, 1945, the phone rings at the White House. Mrs. Roosevelt had stayed home and um, she had business in Washington. And the phone rings and says, oh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, President, the president has fainted. And she says, oh, my goodness, you know, I know he's down there not feeling well. You know, he's down there to rest up. Please keep me posted. Oh, yes, ma'am, we will. Click. A few hours later, the phone rings again. Mrs. Roosevelt, the president has died. Right. He had a stroke and died in Warm Springs, Georgia. So she gets on a train. She goes down. She you know, goes to meet you know, the, you know, the, the, the president's body. Right? She's got to bring that back to Washington. And she says to everyone, what was going on? What was happening? You know, tell me everything that was, was happening. And somebody said, well, he was sitting over there in a chair um, getting a portrait painted. He was sitting next to Lucy Mercer. And then ooh, Lucy Mercer? You mean da, 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 that Lucy Mercer? Yeah, that Lucy Mercer. He had promised he would never see Lucy Mercer again, but in the final years of his life, he had reconnected and was starting to hang around with her again. So now Eleanor Roosevelt is betrayed by her social secretary, not once, but twice, by her husband, not once, but twice. But wait, there's more. It gets even worse. So... Eleanor says, how could this happen? You know, how, how, he promised he would never see her again. How do they reconnect? And Eleanor's daughter, her only daughter, was like, uh, Mom, I got something I got to tell you. Uh, and it was her own daughter who had reconnected these two, right? And right, so there you are, portrayed again. So then Eleanor says, how could you do that? You know the history with this woman. What's going on here? And her daughter, Anna, said, Mom, you have to remember when you're president, everybody that comes through that door wants something from you, right? They want you to make a campaign appearance. They want you to, uh, you know, put something in the budget for them, some kind of, con you know, congressional project in their district. Papa needed to be with people he could just be with because of who he was, not because of what he could do for them. And Eleanor Roosevelt looked Anna in the eye and she said, you know, Anna, you're right. You're right. That was a good thing that you did for Papa. That was a good thing. Can you imagine that, forgiving her for that? So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a life of betrayal. Betrayed by her mother who calls her granny, her father who forgets her when he's drunk, the family who will have her in for a period of time, but not for an extended period of time, her grandma who has her in but is really mean to her all the time and kind of, you know, restrictive. And then Madame Silvestre, the bright light, right, who starts to see Eleanor for who Eleanor is. Then she meets his mother-in-law, right, to this woman who's going to become her mother-in-law and wants her to keep the marriage, you know, the, the engagement secret for a year. He gets married. She gets married. Her husband cheats on her with her um social secretary so she's betrayed there and then she's betrayed once again later on when uh he you know gets reconnected with this woman and it's his own daughter her own daughter who is the one that reconnects them this is a life of betrayal imagine if your friends you know were treating you that way right how would you feel right I, if, I, if that was me i would be like totally like lying on the floor you know crying holding on to my teddy bear eating you know kit kats end to end to end
Okay, that's what I would be doing because I would be so sad. I would eat that comfort food and that cuddly um, teddy bear. But Eleanor Roosevelt did not do that. What she did was after each of these defeats, she picked herself up, she brushed herself off, she got back into the fight. And she believed that she had an obligation to other people who felt as bad as she did for whatever reason to try to make their lives better. Now, I want to read to you a thing called the eulogy. Um, and this is a thing that people say, like at a, at a funeral, like after you die, people get up there and they say nice things about you. And this was something that her friend, Adlai Stevenson, said about her. He said she lived 78 years, most of the time in tireless activity, as if she knew that only a frail fragment of the things that cry out to be done could be done in the lifetime of even the most fortunate. One has the sad sense that when she knew that death was at hand, she was con contemplating not what she had achieved, but what she had not quite managed to do. And I know she wanted to go when there was no more strength to do. There was no sick soul too wounded to engage her mercy. There was no signal of human distress, which she did not view as a personal summons for help. There was no affront to human dignity from which she fled because the timid cried danger. And the number of occasions on which her intervention turned despair into victory, we may never know. Her life was crowded, restless, fearless. Perhaps she pitied most not those whom she aided in the struggle, but the more unfortunate who were preoccupied with themselves and cursed with the self-deceptions, right, thinking they're all that, um, of private success. She walked in the slums and ghettos of the world, not on a tour of inspection or as a condescending patron, but as one who could not feel complacent while others were hungry and who could not find contentment while others were in distress. This was not sacrifice. This, for Mrs. Roosevelt, was the only meaningful way of life. And so what he's saying there is that she took all of that hurt, all that betrayal, and she turned it into compassion, compassion for other people who were feeling bad, compassion for other people who needed hope. And so she brought to the table, so to speak, right? She raised the issues for people of color, for women, for people who were um, sick, for people who were injured, for children, for immigrants, for refugees. All these folks had problems and nowhere to turn. They could turn to her, and then she would bring these ideas to the government, and she would help them uh, to um, have their voice heard and some of these issues and things addressed. Um, I'm going to leave you now with, before we go to questions, two of my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quotes. One of them is that she said, human rights begin in small places, so small that they can't be seen on a map or on a globe. What she means by that is human rights, being nice to other people, that has to begin with you. That has to begin with me, right? You don't have to be a big fancy first lady or first lady of the world. You don't have to be a queen or a king or an ambassador or anybody fancy. All you got to do is be yourself. Be yourself in and among your classmates, your family, your places of religion, your neighborhood, any organizations you're involved with. If you start to be a nicer person today, start to be more compassionate for other people, then the world becomes a better place right where you are this very day. Right? That's the important thing. So human rights begins with you and me. Right? We have to start being nicer to people. We have to start being more compassionate. That's one of the quotes. The other quote I love from Eleanor Roosevelt is she said, you don't have to become a hero overnight. And what she's doing there is she's giving you permission to make mistakes. She's giving you permission to fail. So you know what? Maybe you say, okay, you know, Jeff, you're right. I am going to start human rights where, where I am, and I'm going to start being a nicer person. And then it works for an hour or two, and then you're mean to somebody, right? Does that mean you're a failure? Does that mean you're a bad person? No, it means you slipped up. So as long as you say, oh, you know, I was mean to the teacher. I was mean to the kid down the street. I shouldn't have done that. And you make up with them and you say, hey, I'm genuinely sorry. And you try to correct that, right? Then you'll become a better person and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures. You're going to um, you know, have times that you screw up. Don't internalize it as, oh, I'm a terrible, rotten person. No, you just did a terrible, rotten thing. 
okay? And you can correct that if you choose to. And if you do, you become a better person. And if you do that every day, each day of your life for years and years and years, for 78 years, like Eleanor Roosevelt did, you will become a better person. And because of that, the world will become a better place because you will have a nice impact and a positive impact on the people around you, right? That's what Eleanor Roosevelt was all about. Not wallowing in the disappointment and betrayal that she faced each day over and over again throughout the course of her life, but finding ways that she could help other people who were feeling bad feel better. Let's open it up to some, some Q&A. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see. It's cold in Michigan too. Yeah, good. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry that it's cold there too, but you know, um, my gosh, it's when is winter going to be over, right? Haven't we had enough? Oh, you like my tie? Thank you very much. I will pass it on to the, to the bookstore. Uh, you know, these ties are available in our gift shop and you go online and uh, with the permission of your parents, um, uh, you know, purchase those. Uh, Father's Day is coming around the corner. Uh, yeah, not a super nice mom. What are cold shoulders? Oh, that's a great question. A cold shoulder is when people are not nice to you, right? So you come into the room and your friends are there and you're like, hey, everybody, how's it going? And they're like, oh, good. Uh, you guys want to do something? No, we're all right, right? And they're just kind of not really responding to you. They're kind of being mean to you. That's what it means to give somebody the cold shoulder. And it gets to be really uncomfortable. You know, I mean, you know, if, if your friends were like that every day, you know, like not returning your texts, not returning your calls, not meeting you at your locker, that sort of stuff, that's not going to be much fun, right? You start to feel like, hey, man, I'm left out. Everybody's being mean to me. That's how Eleanor Roosevelt felt. Uh, oh, sorry. It looks like uh, Teresa's already answered that. Sorry about that. Uh, blah, blah, blah. How many people were at the wedding? Oh, there was about 50 or 60 people at the wedding. Um, it was at her aunt's house in New York. So um, she had some of her friends and uh, the relatives that were able to make uh, make it there. Uh, was Marion Anderson upset when Eleanor didn't come? No, she understood. She understood that Eleanor was deliberately not going in order to give her the spotlight. And you know that's what a great friend uh, does. Did she write an autobiography? Actually, she wrote two autobiography. She wrote one and then um, uh, relatively early in her life, and then she wrote another one uh, picking up from, from there later on. Did Anna continue her mom's passion for service? Um, actually, she did. Anna was involved in a lot of educational programming and educational work, um, you know, teaching people to read and making sure, um, you know, people had things and such in, in class. What's an ambassador? Oh, great question. An ambassador is like a representative, OK, so let's say, um, you know, your, your, your mom makes a cake or something for the neighbor who just had a baby. Right. And your mom's like, look, you know, I made this cake, but I got to get back to work. So can you take this over to the Andersons? You're becoming kind of an ambassador for your family. So you take the cake over and you say, oh, hello, Mrs. Anderson. Congratulations on the baby. My mom asked me to give this to you, you know, and she made this cake for you, you know, so that you wouldn't have to, you know, um, cook with the new baby and everything. And you're kind of becoming your mom's ambassador. You're representing her. You're representing your family. And you are, you know, reaching out to someone else. Um, let's see. Uh, did FDR prop, proper, uh, publicly apologize for his affair? No, he never really did public, publicly apologize. Um, they kind of worked it out together between the two of them. And they still remained friends. And they still remained married. But it wasn't quite as cozy as it had been. Uh, up to that point. And that makes me very sad, but that's the way it, it worked out. Um, 20 degrees in Indiana last night. Oh my gosh. No wonder. You bet your chickens had popsicles on them too, icicles. Uh, how did Mrs. Roosevelt die? Great question. Mrs. Roosevelt died. Um, uh, she died of a disease called aplastic anemia, which is a blood disease. She was 78. And um, for whatever reason, her blood just kind of wore out. Um, you know, um, you know, it's one of those things where when you get older, you know, things don't work as well. Well, her blood um, making mechanisms didn't work quite as well. And um, her blood wasn't able to carry oxygen, uh, which is what that's blood's whole job is to carry oxygen. Um, and so she wasn't able to um, have the oxygen that she needed in her blood uh, because of this, um, this uh, aplastic anemia. Uh, did they uh, make any movies about her? 
Um, well, it's interesting you should say that because there was a um, there was a, a movie made about six or seven years ago now, I think it was, called The Roosevelts, and it was about Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, you're going to see, if you go, like, on, you know, with your parents' permission, if you go onto um, YouTube and such, I bet you could look up, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt documentaries, Eleanor Roosevelt speeches, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, movies and things, um, and you'll be able to find information uh, about her. Or what you could do is go to our website, the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, just Google Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, and you'll come to our page, uh, our homepage, go to our um, social media page, and there's all kinds of videos and things there that you can learn more about Mrs. Roosevelt with um, as well. Somebody, I think I just saw a question say, oh, she should have become president. That would have been cool, right? Um, Mrs. Roosevelt actually did not ever want to run for public office. Uh, her grandson, Curtis, was here one time, and I asked him directly. I said, oh, you know, why didn't she ever run for, like, anything, you know? And he said she did not want to run for any public office because she didn't want to be tied to a constituency. And what that means is that when you run and you're elected, right, the people who voted for you are going to expect you to perform for them, right? They're going to, hey, man, I, I voted for you. I elected you to this. You know, now you got to help me out. And she didn't want to be um, – hemmed in by only helping out those people, right? She wanted to be able to help out anybody and everybody, not just the people that voted for her. So she felt that she had a freer ability to move and a freer movement by being able to um, you know, not be tied down to a group of voters uh, who, sur uh, who uh, supported her. Um, if she had run for president, um, I think that um, I think she would have done a great job because she just was a very compassionate person who understood what it was like to be a person, right? And keep in mind, gang, that, you know, this is a woman who was born into a political and financial dynasty, right? This is a woman who was born in and among the fancy people, the cool kids. She had the Roosevelt name. She had the Roosevelt money. She had the Roosevelt connections, but she didn't have the self-esteem, right? She didn't have the confidence in herself. It's something that she worked on her entire life. And, you know, if you're out there and you're feeling like, oh, I wish I could do better. I wish I could be better. You can. You just got to give it a shot. And if you screw up, fess up, clean up, and move on, right? Continue to uh, make better uh, each day. You know, um, you know, sometimes it's not going to happen each day. Sometimes it's going to take you a week before you start seeing progress. You know, don't give up. Mrs. Roosevelt never did. You shouldn't either. And by doing that, you'll make yourself a better person. You'll make the people around you happier, more appreciative of you, and you'll make their lives better. And by doing that, you'll make the world uh, a better place. It's an incredible superpower, really, when you think about it. And you know what? You can start this afternoon. You don't need a degree. You don't need money. You don't need connections. All you need is to be yourself and try. That's simple. Anything else? Doesn't look like we have any other questions, but I just want to take a minute to thank everybody for coming. We appreciate your attendance. And thank you so much, Jeff, for this really incredible presentation. We appreciate your time and all your knowledge. I feel like I learned so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Read up more about Eleanor Roosevelt, you guys. She's a fantastic person, and she continues to inspire people around the world, even to this day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.